Okay, so we're going to start now. So hello everyone and thank you all very much for being here uh, today. My name is Benjamin Hoffman and I'm an associate professor in the Department of French and Italian. And it is my pleasure to introduce our guest, uh, Professor François Fürstenberg, for the annual William Hamill Lecture on the American Tradition. Described by Princeton historian David Bell as, quote, one of the most talented writers of history at work today, François Fürstenberg received a Bachelor of Arts degree from Columbia University and a PhD in history from Johns Hopkins. After a postdoctoral research position at Cambridge University, François Fustenberg became an assistant professor of history at the Université de Montréal, then an associate professor in 2009. In 2014, he joined the faculty of Johns Hopkins University, where he is currently professor of history. Professor Fustenberg is an internationally renowned historian of the United States and the Atlantic world in the 18th and 19th centuries, whose research also includes uh, the early American West, early American historiography, France and American the Age of Revolutions, as well as slavery and early American nationalism. Published in 2007, his first book, in the name of the Father Washington's Legacy, Slavery and the Making of the Nation, examines how images of George Washington in 19th century print culture helped promote US nationalism with a particular focus on contemporary understanding of Washington's slaveholding. Also published by Penguin Books, his most recent book, When the United States Spoke French, Five Refugees Who Shaped a Nation, connects the United States to the French Atlantic world in the 18th century age of revolution. Follows a group of emigres um, who fled the French Revolution and settled in Philadelphia. The finalist for the Washington Book Prize when the United States Book French was named the best book on the early American Republic by the Society for Historians of the Early American Republic. A member of various distinguished scholarly associations, such as the American Antiquarian Society, Professor Fistenberg has received numerous fellowships and awards and was named a distinguished lecturer by the Organization of American Historians and a top young historian by the History News Network list. In today's lecture, Professor Fistenberg will explore a major constitutional flow by examining the states created after the Constitution was ratified, which hold a power that was not anticipated by the debates at the Constitutional Convention. This lecture is entitled The New States and the Problem of Permanent Gerrymanders. Please join me in welcoming Professor Fistenberg. It's a pleasure and an honor to have him with us today. Well, thank you, uh, Benjamin and Benjamin, for that uh, very generous, overly generous introduction. Um, it's, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm, I'm very happy to be here. Columbus is my first time uh, um, in, in these, this part of Ohio, which I'm embarrassed to say because I've spent a fair amount of time reading about and studying in the Ohio Valley and um, the Scioto River Valley in particular. Uh, I should also say thank you to Eric for a wonderful campus tour. Uh, so actually, as I mean, I, I've been invited by the Department of French and Italian, and, and it may seem odd for me to be talking. Benjamin and I went back and forth on, on a, a, the topic that I would um, of the lecture that I would give today, and um, it may seem funny for me to be presenting on a problem of constitutional interpretation, in a sense, in the Department of French um, and Italian. But uh, in fact, in a kind of autobiographical way, there's a sort of logic in there. I was interested, as Benjamin was just saying, in. in um, French connections in the early American Republic, and um, and French interests uh, in in the period that I was looking at in the 1790s focused in large part on this part of the United States. Um, so in a sense, my my interest in this in, in these questions of sort of the West, because Ohio is the West for the region, for the period that I'm interested in, um, was originally interest of the French, and of course the first Europeans in this part of the in this part of the country were also French, not English. So um, since that book came out, I've, I've moved on to other uh, research interests. And, and this, in particular, what I'm going to be talking about today is really the, the very early stages, I think, of, of what may develop into a, a, a big research project, or maybe just a small research project, I'm still not sure. But it's actually a very good time for me to be presenting some of this research, some of this um, thinking, and getting feedback on it now. So I would welcome any questions that, that people or comments or criticisms or whatever that people uh, may have um, at the end of the talk. And, um, and the talk uh, is being filmed, so for, for those who are, uh, you know, for the six of you who will actually watch this on YouTube, uh, be warned that, you know, my ideas may, may change uh, in the meantime. Um, 
where anything gets published. So there are three, three parts to the talk that I'm going to give today. The, the first part is to try to explain what it is I mean by, um, the, problem of, of, uh, by, by the problem of permanent gerrymanders, that is the, the problem of new states as I'm thinking about it, and whether it is even a, you know, even a, a problem. The second uh, part of the talk is going gonna, is gonna to focus really on the constitutional convention debates um, and to look at uh, what I think of as the really inexplicable behavior of the, of the delegates in the constitutional convention um, in coming up with the final language on admission of new states in the Constitution. And the third uh, part of the talk will be just a brief survey, a very brief survey, of how, how things have gone since in, um, in admissions of new states. So I will, um, I'll begin by, by framing the problem um, uh, uh, of new states by talking about some, some very well-known background here. So by the, the mid to late 1780s, there were all kinds of concerns about the Articles of Confederation and the ways in which it wasn't functioning uh, to, to sustain the nation in the face of domestic and international challenges. One of the main concerns about the Articles of Confederation, one of the main criticisms about the Articles of Confederation was that each state had an equal vote. So Virginia, with its 450,000 free population, had the same vote as Delaware, with its 50,000 population. And this seemed, uh, this seemed deeply problematic to many people, particularly Virginians. So, so that would be addressed by a new constitution, which was famously a compact, uh, the, the Articles of, of Confederation was, was a compact between the states, and now the new constitution would famously become a compact among we, the people. I don't think I have to reserve, rehearse in, in great detail uh, today all the, um, you know, all, the, all the ins and outs of that, of that debate. It's kind of standard textbook, standard textbook fair. But um, what, I, what I will say is there was a bitter struggle that was waged by the small states um, on this question of equal, uh, equal rights. Would the small states get some way of, of equal voting in, um, in the new system? And the whole convention nearly broke down on this issue. And I think it's fair to say that this was really the central issue of the constitutional convention debates. But you don't have to take my word for it. Um, the threatening contest, wrote uh, James Madison, uh, much later, it did not turn on the degree of power to be granted to the federal government. It, it turned instead on the rule by which states would be represented and vote in the government. Now, um, it's worth just kind of pausing for a minute on, on that statement, because I think it's easy to, to forget in the context of our politics. So much of subsequent American politics, um, of American political history, revolves around the question of how much power should the federal government have. It's, um, it's, it's still you know, at the center of our politics. Should the federal government be able to provide health care? Should the federal government be in the, uh, in the business of enforcing voting rights? Uh, what, is, what are the limits of the federal government's power? But, but um, it makes it easy to forget uh, that when it came in the 1780s, in 1787 in particular, the central question was, was not on how much power the federal government would get, but on how states would be um, represented in the government. And so the result, the result is the great compromise. Small states got their legislative branch, they got the Senate, uh, and, and the big states got their uh, proportional representation, they got the House. And of course we know some of the results. There's the Electoral College, uh, there are you know, the, the distortions in the Senate that are, that are I think fairly well known at this point. But it seems to me that we've been missing one of the uh, essential consequences of this constitutional compromise. They gave all these power to the individual states through the Senate, but they completely failed to specify who exactly would be getting these dramatic powers. There were 13 states at the time, of course, 12 were in the Constitutional Convention. Vermont and Kentucky were waiting in the wings. I think probably everybody in the convention knew that these were uh, on their way. But how many more would come after the, uh, after the Constitution was, was uh, crafted? Would there be five more states? Would there be 10 more states? 50 more states? 100 more states? Uh, no, one, no one had any idea. What requirements would there be to create new states? Would, uh, would there be some minimum population requirements? Would there be some geographical requirements on size? Limitations, perhaps? Would there be uh, some limitations on the form of government? The Constitution says nothing about any of these issues. Um, there's total silence in the Constitution on these questions. And uh, I personally find this startling. There's so much thought and debate given on the extent of powers of individual state, 
uh, individual states. There's months of heated discussion in the summer of 1787, and, and the result of, of all this discussion and debate and deliberation is this really elaborate um, kind of baroque compromise between 13 states with their divergent interests. Big states versus small states, northern states versus southern states, agricultural states versus mercantile states, slave states versus free states, all, all these divisions, all this all these, um, all these uh, interests, separate interests, are, are, are brought together in this complicated mechanism, which is meant to balance out in, in perfect equilibrium all of these, uh, all of these um, interests. They, were, they have this uh, system of separation of powers, shared sovereignty, federalism, all this complicated uh, machinery. And yet, there's almost no thought whatsoever given to who will belong to this exclusive club of states. It, it seems completely crazy to me. Historians are very interested or very sensitive to issues of teleology, and yet when it comes to the constitutional system, we all seem to accept the growth of the United States across the continent as something that was uh, natural, uh, even inevitable. You, know, you can find maps like this one. This one happens to be taken from Wikipedia. Maybe that's a little bit of a cheap shot. But, um, but you know, you have maps like this in textbooks all over the place, right? You, you, you see what the United States looked like in, this is in 1790. Uh, so you've got the 13 original states. Vermont will soon become a state. Um, it's in gray there, but of course the limits of Vermont stop right at the Canadian border. There's uh, Northwest Territory, unorganized territory. Um, and then um, everything else exists in gray, uh, as though it's all part of the United States to, to become. You've even got Alaska and Hawaii there in the corner, as though they're, we talked about this a little earlier today, as though they're part of the United States to become. You know, there's not even, I used to teach at the University of Montreal, um, and you know, you become kind of hyper aware of maps like this. I mean, sitting in Montreal and you're looking at this map, and you're like, where, <laughs> what happened to Canada? Um, so, <laughs> so, um, so, you know, this is, there, there's a sense somehow when we think, you know, looking forward from 1787 or 1790, that of course, of course these will become states, but um, from the perspective of 1787 or 1790, there's, there's no way of knowing what will eventually become the states. So all of this uh, strikes me, this is my, my um, here's where I bring the problem, right? All of this strikes me as a massively understudied problem. And that is to say, what happens when this, uh, this jerry-rigged constitution, this, this compromise that's kind of patched together with duct tape and pieces of gum, what happens when this government, which was designed specifically and very carefully to accommodate the divergent interests of 13 states, what happens when that uh, government expands from 13 states to 50? And what I want to suggest today is that what through the entire constitutional system out of balance isn't so much the grant of equal power to the states, um, or even the three-fifths clause. It was the creation of new states um, in any particular order. <coughs> and so, and actually, I'll say it. I'm glad to be giving the talk here today in Ohio because Ohio was created um, 1803. Is that right? Uh, and it was the, the way I think about these new states. This was kind of the first of the states to be created by the federal government. But we can, we can come back to that. All right. So let's move on to the Constitutional Convention. Um, and I'll just start with a sort of constitutional blank space, which is the absence of constitutional procedures or criteria for the admission of new states, what I was referring to earlier. The complete lack of, of, of any discussion of this in the constitutional text itself. What's really fascinating to me is that the rules that would eventually govern the admission of new states came not from the Constitution uh, or any, from any of the issues that were actually discussed in the Constitutional Convention or in the ratification debates, which are also largely silent on this question. Instead. Instead, they come from the document that the uh, Constitution was meant to supersede, they come from the Articles of Confederation. So another, you know, perhaps a, uh, a title for this eventually will be the, the Revenge of the Articles or something like that. <laughs> uh, the Articles of Confederation are famously inefficient. They require supermajorities for almost everything. They require nine of 13 states to declare war, to make treaties, to coin money, to borrow money, and so many other issues. Any amendment to the Articles requires a unanimity of all the states and so, of course, not surprisingly, the admission of new states requires a uh, two-thirds majority. And here's what, the, here's what the Articles of Confederation says about new states. It says, Canada, acceding to this confederation and adjoining to the measures of the United States, shall be admitted into and entitled to all the advantages of the Union. They, were, they wrote this hoping that Canada would join the United States in rebellion against Great Britain. I think we got that way. But no other colony shall be admitted into the same, that is the same to the Union, unless such admission be agreed to by nine states. Um, so so uh, the, the Articles of Confederation says 
we are open to growing, we're open to creating new states, but it will require nine states to support that, except, uh, except Canada. So uh, this is um, interesting. The, the Canadian exception actually is kind of interesting to me because uh, it undermines one of the central principles of expansion. I mean, we come to think that expansion requires democratic government for, uh, or Republican government for, for um, admission into the union, but Canada is, is quite famously not Republican. In fact, the Quebec Act abolished the legislature or had, had, had made the province without any legislatures, um, and Americans were furious about this. I mean, they complained bitterly about this in 17. Before, and, and it was one of the recent things that pushed them into a rebellion, in fact, against the British government. And yet here they are saying, no problem, you can come in anyway. Um, there's also one other example which I came across recently and uh, probably merits, in fact, certainly merits further research, and that's the treaty at uh, Fort Pitt. I knew, I knew nothing about this until weeks ago. Um, and this was a treaty with a, the with a Delaware nation. It's actually, I think, the second treaty that the United States makes after the treaty with France. It comes the, the same year. Um, and you know, it, I wouldn't be surprised if it turns out that there's a, uh, a direct uh, connection between the two, and maybe that the Delaware were prepared to sign sign on with the Americans uh, as a result of that treaty. And this treaty with the Delaware provides a uh, perpetual peace and friendship shall henceforth take place between the contracting parties through all succeeding generations. They're getting it's a military alliance to get the Delaware support in the American Revolution. But the the most interesting part of of this uh, treaty comes here. Uh, they say it's further agreed on uh, between the contracting parties, should it for the future be found conducive to the mutual interest of both parties to invite any other tribes who have been friends to the interest of the United States to join the present confederation, they're open to bringing in new Native American nations, and to form a state wherever the Delaware nation shall be the head and shall have a representation in Congress. Fascinating to me. So they're, they're open to the idea of admitting a, a Delaware state, which might be composed of various American nations. I, I don't know actually if there's a parallel. Uh, you can tell me if there's a parallel in other history of Native American uh, treaty making. Certainly, it's worth exploring and, and it raises all kinds of, of tantalizing possibilities uh, about what the United States must have, might have looked like if this had been taken, uh, if this road had been taken. However, unlikely that that might have been. But um, uh, in any case, that's not the road that was taken, as we all know. It went the road that was taken went. Uh, uh, through instead of with uh, Native American uh, uh, nations, and it led it led directly to the Northwest Ordinance. In 1787, um, it's the government under the Articles of Confederation that passed the Northwest Ordinance. Um, it's the it's the it's an incredibly famous act. I imagine all of you have heard of the Northwest Ordinance, one of the most significant acts in in, uh, in American history. And it's interesting in this regard to remind ourselves that this was a law that was passed. Um, by the Congress of the Articles of Confederation. It was passed by the very body that the Constitutional Convention was in the midst of overturning, of overthrowing, superseding, we call a, a coup by, by many historians. Um, the, the Northwest Ordinance was passed by the second tier folks uh, who had been basically left out of the Constitutional Convention. It's a little bit of a cheap shot there too. There were a few of them that were, that were in both bodies. So what does the Northwest Ordinance say about new states? It says, there shall be formed in the said territory not less than three, nor more than five states. And whenever any of the said states shall have 60,000 free inhabitants therein, such state shall be admitted by its delegates into the Congress of the United States on an equal footing with the original states in all respects whatsoever. So um, this seems sensible. This seems what, like, what you do if you're talking about admitting new states. You, uh, you specify exactly how many states are going to be admitted into a territory. You've got this territory, the you know, Ohio Valley, the Great Lakes, and the Mississippi River. You say it's going to be between three and five. It's not going to be one gigantic state. It's not going to be 27 miniature states. Um, you specify the population requirements. You say we want 60,000 people at a minimum for admission into new states. And um, of course, because supermajorities are required for any important matter under the Articles of Confederation, it requires a two thirds vote of the states to admit any new states. This is a big and significant question. So all of this seems very reasonable to me. Um, and then the last thing to note, because it's, it's a really important provision, is this, um, equal, this question of equal footing. All uh, the new states will be admitted on an equal footing with the original 13 states in all respect uh, whatsoever. Uh, as we'll see, I'm going to come back to this question of equal footing. As we'll see, it becomes an important constitutional principle. But, um, but it's a strange, it's a strange and unusual constitutional principle because it was developed actually not by the 
Constitutional Convention wasn't actually uh, developed by those who wrote the Constitution, but by this uh, rump Congress, which was, uh, which was annihilated by the Constitution. And making the matter all the more puzzling, it's not very clear that the um, Congress, that the Congress of the Articles of Confederation even had the authority to make a law about new states at all. And um, if you don't believe uh, me, you can, I can call in the big guns here. Uh, Congress have undertaken to form new states to erect temporary governments, to appoint officers for them, and to prescribe the conditions on which such states shall be admitted into the Confederacy. So this is referring to the Northwest Ordinance. All of this has been done, done without the least color of constitutional authority. Anyone know who said that? Madison. Good. Good guess. Madison and Federalist 38. OK, so they wrote this law, and they had no authority to write it. So there's, um, given the absence of any specificity about these issues in the Articles, and given that the uh, Constitutional Convention is called to uh, fix the problems with the Articles, and given that this law doesn't seem to have any uh, authority over the Articles, you might imagine that the delegates to the Constitutional Convention would spend, spend a fair bit of time debating this issue about the admission of new states. It stands to reason. And um, actually, interestingly, there is some uh, debate about the issue of admission to new states. The, the, the very early draft, the kind of outline of the Constitution, is called, um, uh, comes out of the Committee of Detail, where they outline the principles that will eventually become part of the Constitution. And it begins with a few general principles about new states. First, new states must be uh, within the present limits of the United States. So um, if that's the case, you know, goodbye to Louisiana Territory, you'll need a two-thirds, uh, you'll need, a, you'll need a, a amendment of the Constitution to to bring in any new states west of the Mississippi. Um, and then it also says that you need a two-thirds majority, suffrage of two-thirds uh, of the um, House of Representatives uh, and the Senate to admit any new states. So then this becomes refined into an actual set, into an actual text. Um, and here, too, uh, the two-thirds requirement is maintained. Both houses must support the admission of new states by a two-thirds majority. Um, and it also includes the admission of new states on equal footing, on the principle of equal footing. They'll have all the same rights. Um, new states, it says, shall be admitted on the same terms as the original states, right? So you've got these two, two-thirds requirement and uh, equal footing, equal rights for all new states. And what's interesting is that not everyone agrees with these basic principles. Uh, by which new states should be admitted. One of those who doesn't agree is uh, a delegate from Pennsylvania named Gouverneur Morris, a particularly interesting character, and, um, and someone who, who plays a large role in these constitutional debates in the convention. On July 5th, Morris argued that the rule of representation ought to be fixed as to secure to the Atlantic states a prevalence in the national councils. That constitutional guarantees ought to be in place to prevent the maritime states from being hereafter outvoted by the Western states. So speaking as someone who lives in the state of Maryland, I find this makes very good sense, right? I mean, we are the, the 13 original states. We are the ones who are creating this new document. Why would we create a new document that would eventually make us powerless, right? We need to put in some safeguards here to make sure that we continue to maintain political power. But um, Gouverneur Morris isn't uh, alone in this, in this perspective. This is uh, Rufus King, another delegate. With regard to the new states, he says, there was something peculiar in the business which had not been noticed. This is a speech he gives in the Constitutional Convention. By one of their ordinances, the, the United States have impolitically laid the Northwest Territory out into 10 states. Um, actually, he's probably referring to the entirety of the Western Territory. And have made it a fundamental article of compact that as soon as the number in any one state shall equal that of the smallest of the 13 original states, it may claim admission into the Union. It is possible, then, that 10 new votes may be added without a greater addition of inhabitants than are represented by the single vote of Pennsylvania. In other words, if each of these new states west of the, uh, west of the Appalachian Mountains was admitted as a minimum population requirement, uh, you would all of a sudden have 10 new states. And yet, the population of the, all those 10 states wouldn't even have the population of Pennsylvania. Uh, Rufus King says that's crazy. Uh, a delegate from Massachusetts says the same thing. He was for admitting the new states on liberal terms, but not for putting ourselves in their hands. They will, if they acquire power, like all men, abuse it. They will oppress commerce, drain our wealth into the Western country. To guard against these consequences, he thought it necessary to limit the number of new states to be admitted into the Union 
such a manner that they should never be able to outnumber the Atlantic states. Anyone have any idea who this is? Delegate from Massachusetts? I'll say again, Elbridge Gerry. Elbridge Gerry, very good. We'll come back to uh, Elbridge Gerry. He's the, he's, the, uh, he's the person after whom ger uh, gerrymandering is named. Even, even our friend James Madison is, is skeptical that uh, new states should be admitted on equal terms. The proposal to grant states equal power, he declares, is totally impractical. What would be the effect of this plan if 10 or 12 new states were added? Madison says that um, in, the, in the debates. He says that would be nuts, right? 10 or 12 new states? Well, what about 37? Uh, Madison would have been laughed at the convention if he'd said that. That's ridiculous. So in line with these concerns, on August 29th, Governor Morris moves to strike out the equal footing principle from the Constitution. He doesn't think Congress should be required uh, to allow new states in on equal terms. He says it's a really bad idea to throw the power into their hands. Hugh Williamson of North Carolina agrees. The existing small states enjoy equality now, and for that reason are admitted into the Senate. This reason is not applicable for the new Western states, he says. And it turns out that this is not a marginal point of view. When it comes to a vote, nine states support striking out the requirement of equal footing. I'm just going to repeat that for a second. There's an easy majority, an overwhelming majority, in the Constitutional Convention for removing this principle of equal footing. So um, at this point in, uh, in the Convention, we're in late August at this point, things seem to be on the right track. We're going to restrain the power of the new states. We're going to make sure that the original 13 maintain power. Congress will have the authority to put in whatever provisions they want about these new states to keep them in a kind of, uh, in a, uh, to keep them, uh, to make sure that there's, uh, the 13 original ones are dominant. All these complicated compromises uh, that they spent all this time structuring uh, over the course of the last few months, they're going to make sure it's not going to be modified without great deliberation. Uh, and then we come to a really, what is for me, uh, a completely inexplicable moment, and I have no answer to this question, but this is uh, the, the the moment that I'm really interested in in the Constitutional Convention, uh, Governor Morris, who's been up until then the, the, the most ardent, um, ad, the most ardent advocate for make, making sure the 13 states have the most power, uh, they moved to strike out the two-thirds requirement for admission of the new states. Morris substitutes language that imposes no two-thirds requirement. From there, the debate uh, turns to questions of Western land claims and to the issues regarding Vermont, um, and the the issue of of maintaining a two-thirds requirement for the admission of new states uh, goes away and never comes back. It never comes back for uh, debate. So under the modified language of the Constitutional Convention as of August 29th, it now requires a simple majority to admit new states. And given all the concern that Morris has expressed up until now about new states gaining too much power, um, he's suddenly abandoned the, the, the most important constraint you could have put on the new states, a, a supermajority for admission. So as I say, this is um, this is uh, entirely inexplicable to me. Now let's just put this in the context of the Constitution. The Constitution requires supermajorities for all kinds of important issues. We need a two-thirds majority to override a veto. We need a two-thirds majority to ratify a treaty, uh, in the Senate anyway. We need a two-thirds majority, uh, as we all know these days, to impeach a president. You can't do it on a simple majority. We need, uh, well, to convict a president, let's say, uh, I should say. We need a two-thirds majority to expel a member of Congress, and so on and so on. There's all kinds of, of issues on which, which are deemed significant enough, substantial enough, that a, um, a simple majority is not sufficient. You need a, a supermajority, a two-thirds requirement. Um, and yet, for some reason, when it comes to admitting new states into the Union, which is a fairly significant issue, it only requires a simple majority. Um, so when the text is eventually finalized, when the constitutional text is eventually finalized, after all these months of debate, almost nothing more is said about the admission of new states. The only clause uh, in the final constitution that deals with the admission of new states is Article 4, Section 3. New states may be admitted by the Congress into this union. That's it. New states may be admitted by the Congress into this union. Um, it doesn't say anything. There's not a single constitutional, philosophical, or even uh, practical principle that governs the admission of new states. Aware of the danger that new states might pose to the 13 original states um, in the convention debates, uh, aware of the ways that this could uh, 
uh, unbalance, the, the delicate balance that's been created in this constitutional uh, compromise, they nonetheless throw the door open. They ignore the issue entirely. So uh, hopefully at this point I've convinced you that we do indeed have a problem um, and that we don't yet have an answer. So let's, uh, uh, let's do what historians do when they don't know what the answer is about a problem. Let's look at what happened. And, um, and as I say, I'm going to come to you after I finish talking and hope that you can answer all my questions. So um, in, this, in this last part of the talk, I'm going to uh, just look forward a little bit to how Congress does handle the question um, when it comes to admitting new states. And you know, this, this last bit here will be, uh, by, uh, uh, by necessity, quite superficial and quite um, you know, just spot, just spotty, but um, anecdotal. But um, at least it, it should raise some of the um, interesting questions, I hope. So the first state to be admitted after the Constitution was, uh, was ratified was Vermont. Uh, Vermont was admitted in 1791. It was originally part of New York. I think that is a big fight between New York and New Hampshire. They split off. They threatened to go to Britain. But um, eventually they, they came in. And then Kentucky was the second state admitted in 1792. Both are admitted with uh, all the same rights as the older states. That's in the language that brings that, that, that the uh, Congress passes. Um, and as far as I can tell, uh, after all this fighting about equal rights in the, in the constitutional debate, as far as I can tell, no one proposes bringing them in with uh, lesser uh, rights than the original 13 states. Uh, if there is, I haven't found any, any trace of it. Uh, at this point, we've got, we've got 15 states, um, but these are all states that are coming somewhat out of the original 13. Vermont, out of New York, Kentucky uh, was part of Virginia. In 1796, Tennessee becomes a state. In Tennessee, um, Tennessee essentially came out of North Carolina. Um, and, and it's with Tennessee that the language of, uh, of equal footing gets formalized in the Enabling Act. These are the acts of Congress that are, that are passed in order to make it possible for new states to come in. And um, uh, they say you know, that, the, that Tennessee is hereby declared to be one of the United States of America on an equal footing with the original 13, with the original states in all respects whatsoever. And you can see this language comes straight out of the Northwest Ordinance, the same language that I read earlier. Uh, this is the equal footing language. Um, and that specific language will become part of the enabling legislation of every subsequent state. All uh, We're at 16 now, so the rest of the 34 states that come in all have this exact language, on an equal footing with the original states in all respects whatsoever. And by the 20th century, this, um, this equal footing becomes a constitutional principle. The Supreme Court rules in the 20th century that the Constitution requires the admission of states on an equal footing. Um, and that's an interesting ruling from my perspective, because um, as we've seen, that language uh, that they needed to be brought in on equal footing was specifically stripped out of the Constitution. It was debated, it was discussed, and it was removed by a vote of nine to two, overwhelmingly removed. So somehow the, the Supreme Court snuck it back in to the, um, to the, uh, uh, to the Constitution. I mean, if it is a constitutional principle, I suppose it's a kind of you know, principle like the, like the model of the British Constitution, right? The accretion of law over and over again eventually becomes Constitution. But of course, we don't live under the British parliamentary system. We live under the uh, uh, system of the Constitution, and the original text counts. Uh, so, uh, so uh, well, there you go. It's, um, after, uh, after the, um, so it's hard for me to know what legal or constitutional principle governs the admissions of new states after these first few, after these first um, few states, which are, as I said, have been waiting in the wings in the Constitutional Convention, what happens? Well, through the first half of the 19th century, the main principle that governs the admission of new states, and this is, I think, a well-known feature of our, of, our, of, our, uh, of our history, the main principle is sectional balance between free states and slave states. Um, the creation of this sectional balance is, is um, it's a, it's a well-known story. It's, it's the story of, of you know, antebellum America as it, as it pushes uh, more and more towards civil war. You have all these uh, famous compromises. There's the Missouri Compromise that, that uh, resolves the question of what happens um, to a state when it's, I mean, up until then, you have the Ohio River being a, the border between slave states and new states. Missouri is west of the Mississippi. What's going to happen? Is it going to be a slave state or a free state? Um, it's, it's, uh, um, it's north of the Ohio River boundary, uh, as it ends anyway, but south of the Ohio River, where it begins. Uh, there's a a famous compromise which rescues the Union, brings Maine in to counterbalance. Well, um, what would have happened if that two-thirds majority had been uh, in the Constitution? What would have happened if the Missouri Compromise had, had we required a supermajority for admitting Missouri? Um, 
uh, they barely squeaked through. What about the famous compromise of 1850? California came in to counterbalance Texas and so on. This barely squeaked through. Again, two-thirds requirement um, would have made it impossible. So all of a sudden, you, re you, you realize how, how, uh, how high the stakes are in this question. This two-thirds majority that was changed to a simple majority um, uh, completely altered the course of subsequent American history. And I have to wonder, was any, was any significant, um, any constitutional change of this kind of significance, was it made without any debate uh, whatsoever, or any retrievable debate anyway? Uh, I, I, doubt, I doubt that's the case. Starting in 1845, with the admission of Florida, the new states outnumber the original 13 states. By 1850, there are 18 new states and 13 old states for a total of 31. Those new states are, um, in my opinion, fundamentally different from the original 13. The old states created the federal government. They're the ones that got together in the Constitutional Convention in 1787 and came up with the idea for a new federal government. The new states uh, were created by the federal government. They're, the new states um, don't represent pre-existing political communities. These aren't, these aren't uh, polities that had existed for a century or so and, and need to be recognized. These are just lines on a map drawn fairly arbitrary, if our, in fairly arbitrary ways. I'll give a, uh, an example to the whims of a bare majority in Congress. Um, and the old states, uh, the old states came about by a, a, a great resistance to central authority. They, they rebelled against the British government and its attempts to consolidate authority over the, the colonies. The new states were uh, just the opposite. They were created by an assertion of power by the central authority. Uh, so they represent a very different kind of union, it seems to me. Um, and as I, as I sort of began looking into this issue, one of the things that really strikes me about the ways that new states were carved out is the, is the sheer arbitrary nature, the, uh, you might call it a capricious nature, of these state boundaries. Uh, for the most part, these state boundaries were drawn um, uh, to solve immediate pressing political problems. Um, usually, it had to do with slavery, but, but, they were, um, but there were other political problems that resulted in the kind of compromises that, that led to the borders of new states. And it was all done. Um, Fairly haphazardly, it was, it was, you know, your your classic political horse trading that led to the creation of these new states. So um, I don't have, you know, I don't have a whole lot of time. I have a few minutes left, but um, uh, uh, but I'll give one example, which is fairly close to home. Does anyone know why Toledo is in Ohio and not in Michigan? Mm -hmm. Toledo actually, in the original state uh, borders, Toledo was uh, was north of the uh, of the Ohio border. Um, and, there was a, and the, re the reason it was eventually brought into Ohio was, was a kind of classic case of political horse trading. The original line that had been drawn um, up here had, had uh, uh, up here, at Toledo, as you see, um, uh, it would have been north of the Ohio border. Uh, well, that was a, a bummer for Ohio because, you know, it's a beautiful port. It's the Maumee River comes in. I mean, this is an essential passageway. Uh, a lot of trade will come out through this port of, of Toledo. Uh, so if you're in the state of Ohio, you would like to have uh, Toledo, and so they, they claimed it. And then when, Mich when it came time for Michigan to become a state, Michigan said, no, uh, actually, Toledo should be in Michigan. And they, they in fact, called up the militia. There was almost a, an armed conflict uh, over this sort of border, uh, maybe mini border war between Michigan and Ohio. And eventually, Congress found a solution. They compromised. Um, you can ask, why, did, why does the Upper Peninsula belong to Michigan? Well, it's because Toledo was given to Ohio. Uh, so, you know, originally the borders of Michigan would have gone up here um, uh, and just had a small piece of the Upper Peninsula to include, you know, the port of the, the transit port of Mitchell Mackinac. But, um, but they expanded it. They said, okay, if you, give up, if you get Toledo to Ohio, you give up this little strip of land here, we will give you the whole Upper Peninsula. So Wisconsin ended up a big loser in, in, in this. Um, and what about Chicago? Here's another small example. Under the original state border, Chicago should have been part of Wisconsin, but uh, a very far-sighted, uh, representative, a uh, uh, delegate actually getting the voting power in Congress, the territorial delegate said, uh, actually, can we move the state borders up a little bit so that we can get Chicago? No one objected, so they got Chicago. So it became part of Wisconsin. So actually, Wisconsin's a big loser in all of these deals. Um, so um, as you see, there's, there's, uh, there's a lot of kind of strange, you know, frustrating, haphazard nature to the creation of state borders. But once, once they're admitted, uh, they're admitted for good. That's it, done. You can never redraw that border. Uh, the capriciousness continues. In fact, it, it increases as you move forward in time. Um, there's no 
political principle that seems to govern the admission of new states after the Civil War. Um, up until then, at least you can say, well, you know, there's this preservation of the balance of power between free and slave. We're trying to keep the union together. You might not call that a philosophical principle, or you might object if you did call it a philosophical principle, but at least it has some political logic to it. After, um, after the, uh, the Civil War, there's no logic that seems to govern uh, the admission of new states, it's, it, unless it's just pure partisan advantage. Oh, it's gerrymandering. One notable event happens between November 1889 and July 1890. In just nine months, six new states are admitted to the Union. That is a record, beyond doubt. Nothing else like it exists in American history. Six states in nine months. Um, those, those state admissions seem to have been based uh, purely on achieving partisan advantage for the Republican Party, which was in power uh, in both branches of Congress and in the presidency for the first time since Reconstruction. So suddenly, uh, within nine months, 12 new senators take their seats in the US Senate and, and alter the balance of power. That's 19 votes that were added to the Electoral College. And how was that done? By a simple majority vote in Congress. The final six states come in, four uh, before World War I, and then the last two, Alaska and Hawaii, in 1959. And then the whole thing stops. Since 1959, our Senate has been frozen at 100. These lines that were drawn quite arbitrarily on maps in response to the most contingent of political circumstances are, are there forever. They can't be unmade by any constitutional system that we have. It's now been 60 years since the United States uh, uh, admitted any new states into the Union. 60 years. We've never had a, a stretch like that in all of American history. Why have we stopped? It's, um, it's hard for me to say. Maybe we just like the round number of 50. <laughs> can't say it's because they are outside the continental United States. We have two states that are outside the continental United States, so that can't be your answer. Uh, maybe we just don't want to admit 3 million Latinos from Puerto Rico uh, or 600,000 African Americans from Washington, D.C. Whatever the reason is, we stopped. Uh, Bedford, the delegate from Delaware, in the Constitutional Convention in 1787, he said, Delaware now stands at 1 13th of the whole. When the system of equal representation obtains, Delaware will be 1 90th of the whole. Uh, it was on this principle that they fought bitterly, these small states fought so bitterly to make sure that they had some grant of equal power in the Senate. They could not tolerate, Delaware couldn't tolerate the idea of being 1 90th of the, of the, um, of the ultimate uh, representation in Congress. And they, they walked out. They threatened to walk out. They were willing to blow up the entire uh, Constitution over this issue. right? And yet, um, Delaware today now stands in the House at 1 out of 435. In the Senate that he fought so hard to, uh, to, to uh, attain, Delaware stands at 2 out of 100, as to say 1 out of 50. If 190th of political power was intolerable to Bedford, if he was willing to blow up the Constitution over this, how is he OK with these numbers that we have today? Uh, and so the point is, really, that every single one of the 13 states that created the constitutional compromise ended up losing. They bargained, and they bargained for all those months in 1787. And then they gave up everything through this back door by this new clause admitting states on an equal footing. And they did it without any apparent reflection at all. And um, I would say that there's a whole host of ironies in this situation today, uh, not least of which is, is, and this finally brings me to the title of the talk, we worry a lot about gerrymandering. Um, and for good reason. Gerrymandered districts are fairly outrageous, right? I mean, you get these state legislatures that kind of draw these, these borders in very arbitrary, creative ways, not arbitrary, very creative ways, let's call it. Um, uh, for pure partisan advantage. Um, and, you know, there's reasons to be outraged about that. But, uh, but um, you know, they get undone after 10 years. I mean, they have to be redrawn after every 10 years. So they only last, I mean, the damage will only last 10 years, period. Uh, on the other hand, um, these new states are permanent, these states. And actually, these gerrymanders give them credit. I mean, they, they spend a lot of time thinking about it. At least they're pretty careful about the way they draw these states. Uh, these, congressional borders in these districts. I mean, the Congresses that passed these new states seem to have been completely careless and reckless. Um, so by the, uh, by, the stand, by the standards of our outrage of, about gerrymandered congressional districts, the, the real outrage uh, ought to be the, the gerrymandering of the, of the rest of the states. In 1790, the population of Virginia, the largest state in the Union, was 747,000 people, including slaves. Today, there are more people in North Dakota. Uh, I mean, why are there even two Dakotas? Because some corrupt Congress in 1890 decided that there should be. They got an extra two senators. Uh, 
the two Dakotas together have a population of 1.6 million. They have four senators. That's twice as many senators as California has with its population of 39 million. So these new states, what are they? They're gerrymanders that can never be undone. Or if you want to put it in the terms of, of British political history, these are rotten boroughs, these states. Um, they were created one at a time. They were created uh, for reasons that were grounded in the most uh, base political uh, motivation uh, on the most contingent of political circumstances, and they re remain with us uh, forever. So there we are. <laughs> so um, as I say, I'm happy, to, I'm happy to take questions, as many questions as you want to ask. I'm happy to get feedback, commentary, objections, whatever you might have. <laughs> I was just really curious about the, the equal footing question and how that just suddenly comes back up despite all the discussion that the discussion mentioned. It also makes me wonder, um, down the line, many new states on equal footing, in some ways I feel like hides the American imperial project a little bit. Um, and I wonder, uh, this is sort of an alternative history question, if um, if states were committed on equal there was some sort of difference in terms of the privileges, would the sort of American imperial project be a little bit more nakedly noticed throughout yeah. the 19th century? Um, I, that's, a, that's a good question. Um, it's a good question. You know, would, the, would the project be more flagrantly imperial if we, just, if we gave up the pretense uh, of republicanism and said everything is equal footing? I mean, I think, I think uh, your question points to exactly the reason that ultimately the footing was so persistent. So when it comes to, when it comes to the, so the equal footing language comes out of the Northwest Ordinance, as I said. Um, the Northwest Ordinance was originally passed by Congress under the Articles of Confederation. Uh, the first Congress of the Constitution repasses the same law word for word, kind of brings it, you know, formalizes that language. But um, what's interesting is that, as we've seen, the, the question of equal footing um, is not in the Constitution. So uh, Congress could have done whatever it wanted. It wasn't required to in the states on equal footing. Um, it was only an act of Congress, the Northwest Ordinance, that made uh, equal footing uh, required, and it was done so many times it eventually became uh, understood as a constitutional principle. Now, why did they do it that way? They did it for exactly the reason you mentioned. Um, they did it because uh, having so recently fought a war against Great Britain in the name of, of uh, sort of colonial independence, um, it would have been very awkward to begin uh, to begin creating new states and then not giving them the equal rights uh, that the uh, other 13, the original 13 states had. That would have um, you know, that would have sort of been, uh, it would have seemed to, con to, to contravene the very principle uh, for which they've been fighting. Now, you know, you might object, as, as your question I think does, that uh, in all kinds of ways they contravene the principles for which they've been fighting, right? They, they proclaimed equality, uh, they had slavery, they became liber liberty and, and autonomy, they were perfectly happy, um, you know, waging war against Native Americans and, and, and killing them in order to take their land. Uh, so in all kinds of ways they were hypocritical, why not this way? Well, we discuss that issue. Um, uh, I, I think, you know, I think, it's not entirely a matter of principle. I think there are also certain um, partisan considerations that come into play. So one of the reasons that, I mean, the people who push the hardest for equal rights for the new states are uh, Republicans and Jeffersonians. Um, they know that these new states are largely Jeffersonian in, in orientation, Democratic Republican in orientation. Uh, the Federalists actually don't mind keeping, and, and in fact, they speak up. I mean, you know, this is where I think the research has to go uh, from here. Um, initially is, is Federalist objections to new states, uh, because they do object to some of these new states, and they try to delay time of which, and, and they don't seem to mind um, uh, keeping these states in a kind of subordinate status, or at least keeping these territories, I mean the territories are by definition in a subordinate status. They don't seem to mind keeping the people there in a subordinate status. So, you know, you can only get so far with the, you know, it's a matter of principle that they, that they give them equal footing, but, um, but you're right, I mean, it would have been in a sense more honest to, to Simply say, <laughs> we're an empire that's act imperially, right? I mean, we still haven't said that uh, today. Question. Yeah, so I'm still going to push you on this last part. On the, so I, I guess what I'm wondering if the um, the issue is that uh, they cannot be changed anymore, the these borders or their history. So I know you are a historian and not a politician. So like one question would be: Are you advocating for? Uh, um, finding a way, a constitutional way to change them, it seems impossible. Uh, or there's maybe more a, a historical issue, say an issue with traditions, uh, uh, with how they are, uh, these borders were drawn in general, because it seems to me that most 
well, not most, but a good part, a good majority of borders everywhere uh, in the world are kind of arbitrary, especially yeah. in countries that have um, have had a colonial history, and we always forget that this country also had a colonial history, so this doesn't surprise me too much. I mean, in a sense, it surprises me much more than me, is France, and not part of Italy. You know, there's, it's always, you know, this kind of borders, they always have some degree of arbitrariness. So how is this specific case uh, so different than others, and uh, you have to in for a change or a little bit? Okay, well that's a, that's a good question because you raise a, a series of very good points there. Um, and I think uh, if I were the, the compromising type, I might tell you that I will give you Nice back to uh, Italy if you will allow us to have just one Dakota. Um, <laughs> uh, I, I don't, so you're right. I mean, the, the point that all borders are arbitrary is, 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 is uh, absolutely right. I mean, ultimately, right? I, you know, the, they, these are historically created um, uh, uh, artifacts. And so in that regard, they're, you know, arbitrary, they're a product of history, uh, and once they're there, they're there. Um, I mean, part of what, I guess part of what the impulse is here is to, uh, I mean, is to kind of denaturalize the, the states, right? So we do have a sense that, you know, uh, if you're from Ohio, it, it, you know, you see the logo everywhere. I've seen it all over the campus today, right? The, the borders of Ohio, I mean, I have to admit, it's a little unfamiliar to me because I haven't spent a lot of time in Ohio, but to, uh, to most of you, it probably just looks entirely natural, right? It should have this kind of square shape with this, fuzzy, you know, funny little jaggedy bottom. Um, and that's just the way Ohio is. I mean, I could, you know, there's, there's the same thing for for, uh, for Maryland or you know almost any any other state. Um, and so, uh, you know, part of the impulse here is, you know, we really need to remind ourselves uh, that that these aren't, you know, there's nothing natural about Ohio. Uh, you would point out to say, you know, that's true of, of everything, and, and I would basically agree with you. Um, is there a is there a um, you know what's my political objective here? Uh, um, <laughs> I, you know, I don't I don't. I'm not sure that I have what I, an answer to that exactly. I mean, um, you know, uh, no one's going to listen to me anyway. They don't even listen to me in my department, you know, so they're not going to listen to me. That's a change in the Constitution. Uh, uh, I, I think, I don't know, I mean, I think that we need to, I think the system, uh, this was a, the way I see it, this was a, a major flaw in the Constitution. We're, we're pretty well aware of some of the other flaws, right? Um, and I don't think it's very, I don't think it's very controversial to say that three fits compromise, for instance, is a flaw. I mean, I, you're not going to find many people standing up to defend that today. Um, I think, uh, you know, many people, there, there's probably a little bit more debate about this. So I think the Electoral College uh, strikes me as a flaw. I think many people would agree with that, probably have a majority who would agree with that. Other people would defend it for various reasons. Um, this one, it seems to me, we just need to start thinking about. Uh, it's, it seems like, it seems to me like a flaw. Um, that is to say, we have, we have a, uh, a simple majority requirement to, to, uh, to, to recalibrate the balance of power in the Union. So that strikes me as, a, um, as having had severe consequences, which we need to notice and then think about what, what is it that we can uh, do about that. I mean, I think constitutionally, there's very little we can do about it, right? It's a little bit like the Electoral College. We, we seem to be stuck with it, um, or all kinds of other principles you know, in the Constitution that we're sort of stuck with. So I mean, in a sense, it's just kind of making visible some of these things that we tend not to think about. I think that, you know, if I had to say what, what the objective, what the political objective is here, it's, 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 uh, it probably stops there. I mean, if I were king, I would do a lot of things differently. <laughs> no one's going to give me that power, and that's probably a good thing. Yeah, um, I was thinking a little bit about uh, partisanship again. I'm thinking about um, the Federalists and really the demise of the party, uh, certainly in the wake of the War of 1812. So, you know, I, when we talk about the Federalists, we often think of the high Federalists, the very Hamiltonian ones that want a very powerful state, a standing army, and things like that. Then we think of the more moderate Federalists, who sort of join with the more moderate of the, um, you know, the anti-federalists become a democratic republican. So I wonder if, um, if the high federalists have been able to maintain their power more, do you think they may have been more in mind or more in favor of this sort of equal footing model because they may have seen this perhaps a source for a larger standing army to fight wars against France or wars against Britain potentially? Do you think if the federalists in general had been able to survive longer that maybe there would have been a change in this system? So high federalism and federalism as a whole. Yeah, OK, another really good question. Because I think someone just pointed that out to me a few days ago, and, and I hadn't thought to, to uh, look here. But um, the Hartford Convention um, is concerned. Now, the Hartford Convention is a, a convention of, of uh, New England federalists, largely, who meet in 1814, I think. Uh, to, um, to, they're, they're very angry about the War of 1812. They're very angry about Virginian and Republican domi uh, domination of the federal government. They, um, 
And you know, they, they threaten to, to secede uh, from the Union if, if, if the compact isn't redrawn. Um, you know, they have that terrible timing for it to, to meet and then give the resolution just as the War of 1812 finishes in a, in a you know, heroic victory for, uh, by Andrew Jackson. And it, it, um, it makes them, it, it basically destroys the Federalist Party. Um, but the debates that they have and the thinking, that the ways in which they're thinking are, I think, quite similar to, and actually some of the same characters, right, who, who've been objecting to this in the Constitutional Convention. Um, I think it, it comes directly out of the line of thought that I've been um, talking about here today. So I think the Federalists are the place to look right now um, for the first place. Now, you, know, you can imagine a different scenario. What if, what if um, the War of 1812 hadn't ended then or, or had ended uh, quite differently with a, more devastating, with a you know, more devastating defeat for the United States? It's quite possible that the compact, the constitutional compact, uh, you know, which was only 20 years old or so, uh, could have been re redrawn. And one of the major demands that, that, that they would have insisted on would be higher thresholds for the admission of new states. The Federals were very unhappy with the way these new states were coming in and the political power they were giving to the Jeffersonians and to the South more generally. So you can imagine a, uh, a, a redrafting uh, then. It's, it's probably too late now to go back to your uh, uh, question that just before. Um, you know, it may lead in, in, also, I'm not sure, I mean, you know, I, this is a, I'm, I'm not very familiar with uh, a lot of this writing, a lot of this scholarship, but, you know, Calhoun later, in a different page, comes to have uh, lots of objections and, and lots of, uh, lots of interest in developing some kind of sort of supermajority requirements for all kinds of things, mm -hmm. um, because in that case, he's very concerned about slavery, he wants to defend slavery, so I suppose, you know, one of the ways of thinking is the, you know, the kind of supermajoritarian thinking uh, here, I mean, in, in a weird way, and perhaps uncomfortable way, some of what I'm arguing here is that um, in the name of a more democratic nation that we should have had supermajority requirements to make changes. So, you know, there's a problem in that. Um, and, you know, that may align me with Federalists in ways that I'm not entirely comfortable um, uh, being aligned. But it's, it's something that's been through. But I think you're right. I mean, I think the, the Federalists are the ones who were the most concerned about this issue, and, and they were the ones that, you know, they, they, they disintegrated, uh, you know, uh, in the teens. So, um, so that, that tradition that could have pushed back against this uh, disappeared. There's a question here. Right. Um, as a French scholar, I don't think about the U.S. that much, but um, this is so new. I'm in the D-list, too. Yeah, this is all just so recent. But um, I'm thinking now about, if you, if, would you like to play a little bit with sort of the parallel um, creation of the département in France? France, which are drawn in 1790, so kind of at the same time that this pot is being stirred in the U.S., um, and, and following very different lines, right? They're trying to um, create national unity and erase the feudal um, larges and the smalls, and, um, and and so they pick geographical names and they try to make everything the same size. And the, you know, the, we've got the super regions now very recently with interesting economic um, consequences, political consequences. So um, just because it's a French and Italian sponsored lecture, can I throw you that, <laughs> that nugget and see what you do with it? Um, yeah, that's interesting. I hadn't thought to, to compare it with it, but, but that is a similar exercise, isn't it? In, uh, at roughly the same time um, to sort of create a, a unified space and then sort of carve it up in somewhat um, uh, I don't know what the word is symmetrical, not, not quite the word I'm looking for, and, you know, e e equivalent um, uh, districts, right, in these départements. Um, well, it's a redrawing, and you, I mean, I think one of the things you're suggesting in the talk is, oh, we're not doing any, and it is interesting in the U.S., we, we, we don't seem to touch redrawing or think about that, but. Yeah. The French are much, they're much more open. So, the ways they were drawn, I mean, they were all done at the same time. So, you know, there's lots of differences, right? Because these were drawn over pre-existing political communities for the most part, I think, right? Um, I mean, you had, like, Normandy or, you know, other, uh, other uh, regions that had had some political coherence uh, for some, some stretch of time. Um, and the, the, the Departement, I think, just, just uh, kind of went across those. Is that right? Or chopped them up, anyway? Uh, yeah. It, I mean, they, took geog they used geographical... Um kind of landmarks and dividers in large part. And um, yeah, they tried to break up, you know, there were small duchies in large counties and so on. Um, so there's a, an effort to efface some of that. Yeah. Um, I mean, the only pre-existing communities here are Native American, and they're clearly not taken into account in, in the drawing of the well, they lend their names sometimes, yeah. They do. The, the closest, the closest um, 
quote that we can come to is Jefferson. I don't have an image here with, with me, but you know Jefferson has these great maps of, of how he imagines the Northwest Territory, mm. um, and and so he chops. And actually, he, he has one. There's one map that's also great about the whole. It's the whole uh, region between the Appalachians and the Mississippi, and he carves it up. And so he comes up with these interesting names, right? Some of them are classical names, and some of them are Native American names. But he wants to do this in a kind of symmetrical way. He's notably uninterested in geography. I would, you know, I don't know how how interested in geography the the Baltimore were. I mean. He does follow the Ohio border, but after that, it's just straight lines across and straight lines down. Um, you know, I, I would guess if I had not know it, it's, a, it's an interesting question. Um, I would guess that, that uh, the French are more logical about it. Maybe I'm just being a, the most of them are named after rivers. Okay, um, and you know, clearly they take the whole, they take this space and carve it up. The Americans only do that for the space between the Mississippi and the and the, uh, and the Appalachian. So you know, the, a relatively small amount of the space that we know today is the United States. They, they can't. Um, they don't even know what the rest of it looks like, and certainly they don't know that it's going to become part of the United States. So that, that makes it fairly different, too. Um, I don't, I'm not sure that I have all that much to add. I mean, Jefferson would be the one who, who would come the closest, maybe to the French model, perhaps not surprisingly, because of the way he thinks, and the time he spent in France, and the time he spent um, you know, in political discussions with some of his collaborators. It would be interesting to know whether any of Jefferson's um, uh, uh, interlocutors in Paris were actually, you know, whether they discussed any of these things, you know, and this question of how do you redraw the map of France. Um, I mean, Jefferson is, uh, you know, this is not a, a great revelation. I mean, Jefferson is really the key figure in, in this whole, um, in formulating, in, in formulating the, uh, the logic of Western expansion. Um, and, uh, you know, in terms of the Northwest Ordinance, in terms of the ways that the, the, the West and the Northwest are going to be chopped up. Um, and so, I, you know, I would say that, you know, he's probably the to, to try to answer a question like that. Thank you. Uh, question here. So, um, leading up to the time of the Civil War, you were talking about how free and uh, slave states were equal. So, at that time, they were also bringing in some new states. Was there kind of like just like an unspoken, I don't know the right word, like dialogue that if we, because obviously one of those votes would have had to flip to go majority. If we give you a slave state, you have to give us a free state, or like how was that exactly politically? Uh, that, I mean, that's exactly how it worked. So, so there was a, a very conscious, um, a very conscious decision to to make sure that they they maintain an equilibrium between the free and the slave states, and that began as far back as Kentucky. I mean, there's, I found this little this little um, ditty. I mean, this wasn't intentional, but I found this little ditty which says, you know, Vermont came in uh, to the north, so they don't say free slave, so Kentucky comes in as part of the south. Um, and so they make they make sure um, at all points, and so you know this all blows up, as I said, with with Missouri. Um, mm -hmm. By the time by the time you get to uh, uh, Missouri, uh, the creation of Missouri, you have um, uh, get down here. Um, you, you you know you, you've had this kind of balance that's worked its way through. And up until then, it was largely unspoken. Um, up until then, it was largely unspoken, and it, it's the Missouri crisis that brings this to the to the um, to visibility. So you know, Jefferson has some famous lines talking about the you know fire bell in the night. Everybody suddenly woke up because for the first time, the um, the voting on this issue was one that was purely sectional and was no longer based on, on party affiliation or other other divisions. Um, and and it alarms everybody. It looks as though the I mean, Missouri is a, you know as I said, it's in a, it's in a strange place, right? Because if you look at it on the map. Uh, Missouri here. Um, if you look at it on the map, well, you, you would see that it comes it comes in above above the Ohio River, and the Ohio the Ohio comes in, uh, and so it's here. So so logically, since it's above the Ohio River, it ought to be a it ought to be a free state, right? But the Ohio River, um, unfortunately, is you know it goes southwest, so it's here. It's on the same latitude as Kentucky. Uh, which is a which is a free uh, which is a slave state, but it's above the Ohio, which is a slave state. Of course, the Ohio doesn't cross. So anyway, they don't know what to do. They have this huge controversy, and at that point, the solution that's created that's that the, the resolution is we'll allow Missouri to come in as a slave state, but we're going to bring Maine in, which up until then had been part of Massachusetts. So we'll keep an equilibrium, um, and after that, it becomes entirely conscious. Like every time a slave state comes in, there has to be a free state and vice versa. So so that, and so this is part of the reason that Texas raises so many. Concerns because you now you have a slave state coming in, and eventually they break California, and so. But these are all attempts to keep the peace between North and South, and make sure that neither one will have will have a balance of power um, in the Senate. Following up on Ryan's question, I was going to ask a similar question about you said something about how state boundaries are drawn to kind of address or solve immediate pressing problems, and then you gave you said the example, for example, slavery, um, and so 
this is one piece of that puzzle, but are there other examples where there's a state boundary that's specifically drawn to address you know, something that having to do with slavery that you know, was, was, a, was a big pressing problem at the time? Uh, wait, so say that again. Was there, an, was there a state boundary that was drawn in so order to? You said that a lot of times state boundaries were brought, drawn to address or, or solve um, immediate pressing problems. And you said, for example, slavery. I think that's what you said. Yeah. And I was just curious if that's, that's super interesting to me, where the actual drawing of the state boundary would be less arbitrary and more, OK, we have to you know, draw this, create this boundary, because something is happening possibly in a state having to do with whether it's going to be a slave state, a state or a free state. So yeah, I mean, um, the the big you know the big controversies had to do with the, with the territory west of the Mississippi. I mean, what the, you know, it was all the, the all the territory that had been uh, acquired in Louisiana Purchase, um, and these are the areas that they're that they're fighting about. I mean, the, the Ohio border provided a convenient resolution up until then, right? The Ohio River boundary. Um, it was sort of natural, and you could say that which ones are going to be slave and free. But then once you move west, there's no there's no sort of natural uh, boundary that's going to be a clear demarcation. <coughs> now. Um, some people, you know, have ideas about what will naturally be uh, places where slavery can succeed, flourish, and places where slavery won't uh, be able to be implanted, right? So, like, in, um, you know, parts of the North, they think, well, you know, this could never be a, a society where slavery would be required anyway, based on the kinds of agriculture uh, that, that, are, that, that are producible there. You, know, you can't grow sugar, you can't grow tobacco, so we're not going to need slavery. So these are naturally not going to be slave states, but, um, you know, there's a lot of... These these uh, these claims are often asserted, but um, but contravened by the experience that subsequently happened. So I mean, even in the north, even in the northwest states, there's lots of attempts to introduce slavery into these um, into the regions, in southern uh, Illinois and southern Indiana, um, and uh, and then once you get you know once you get west, um, I mean, famously, you know, the Nebraska Territory is opened up to slavery by uh, by uh, Dred Scott, the decision, and and you know. If you genuinely believe that slavery can't implant itself in that region, you shouldn't be concerned by that. But of course, you know the, the, that's not the way it works. I and mean, slavery, as people I think recognize now, is this very malleable institution. It can, it can implant itself almost anywhere. Um, and so, so uh, I think I think it's fair to say that up until the Civil War, every state admission and every state boundary was uh, slavery was the you know was just underneath. <coughs> Fights about slavery lay just behind those those um, concerns and those issues. I mean, there are some concerns that you know clearly aren't about slavery. The, the fight over Toledo and that little strip of land. I mean, that's not about slavery, right? Uh, uh, the Chicago one either. But but um, but you know, for the most part, uh, a lot of these fights uh, have everything to do with slavery. I mean, it just keeps reemerging over and over again. Um, and you know, I mean, I'm not the first one to recognize it, but you know, the slavery slavery issue. Uh, uh, would have would have looked very differently politically had the United States not been expanding continually. I mean, it was the expansion of the United States that that brought the slavery issue into politics repeatedly and repeatedly until it led to civil war. So I have a couple of random thoughts, but uh, early on you mentioned how uh, they kind of an about face, right? So they they had this majority vote that they should be entered in on equal footing, and so you kind of. You, you kind of lost where, where that why that happened. But I think that there was, maybe it was a solution, right? Because I think you're gonna find in, in these early debates about um, conspiracy theories, um, foreign invasion, um, and, and I think you know, settlement of these, of the Northwest Territory in particular, uh, would establish boundaries, would establish governments that would help uh, protect those, those uh, potential problems that they could um, because they were they were definitely a lot, right? I mean, they were coming out of the, from the Spanish, the Native Americans, from the British Convention of the War of 1812. So those might have superseded the the issue of bringing them on, on equal footing. And I think it also, in, in, in thinking about that, is that is that creating another problem if they're not entered in on an equal footing? You already have these major compromises that are going on. Would this have to eventually be another major compromise that states came into uh, the union? And then I think as you know, so I think the key here is to look forward to what kind of debates that they have on expansionism at this point. They had the Northwest Territory, um, the Louisiana Territory will come later, the, the territories from Mexico will come later. But I think by that point, the perspective has changed, right? I think it has by changed. By which point you're talking about? Well, okay, so I mean, when you get the Louisiana Territory, you have millions of acres of land. And I think the government changes its idea or becomes far more aggressive 
and trying to, to get people to move on to this land, especially after the Civil War, that's absolutely in terms of manifest destiny, it's absolutely true. So I think you know the states that come in later uh, can't be really applied on the same principle of what's going on in the constitutional base. I think by that point it's completely changed, the perspective is completely changed by that point. So and these are just some of the issues I saw at the time as you were moving through this, is that you know, there, maybe there's outside pressures that are, are forcing their hand in a lot of this that yeah. maybe you need to, you know, I don't know how much um, there is to be on this. No, I, I think you're right about that. So, you know, uh, had, had, for instance, they said, um, in, you know, that Congress made it clear that these new states in, in the West, including Ohio and so on, would come in uh, as subsidiary states, they wouldn't get equal rights in Congress. It, it would have been hard to attract people to leave it would have been hard to persuade people to leave, uh, you know, uh, places where they had political rights to go to the and they would lose those political rights. Uh, and as you say, settling these territories was was um, an existential issue for the United States. I mean, if they didn't get, you know, bodies on the ground, they were at risk of losing these uh, these regions, especially in the Northwest, right? To, to Native American resistance, to the British, uh, to some combination of the two, perhaps to the Spanish. I mean, they were all, you know, were attempts by the Spanish to move Kentucky and Tennessee. Uh, and so, so I think you're quite right that. Um, if you if you send people there and you don't give them political rights, why are they going to be loyal to you, right? So so um, so you might lose them. I mean, perhaps they would perhaps they would join up with England. Uh, you know, perhaps they would join up with Spain. Um, so so there's a kind of um, the, the Congress is in that sense, the federal government is in that sense, in a weak position to, to negotiate on this question, right? I think that's I think that's unfair. Um, so and 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 I think you're right also to say that by you know by the 1830s the situation is quite different. So okay, so uh, one of the interesting this this so um, as I say, I don't I haven't found many people who've written on, on these issues, um, but Peter Olaf has a really good book on the uh, Northwest Ordinance and Northwest Territory, and he's written a lot on these issues. Um, and one of the points that he makes, what I didn't ever thought about, is that um, in the original thinking, in, in Jefferson's original thinking, uh, you send people west. Uh, you give them the promise of statehood and equal rights, and and the states will just kind of form organically, right? Um, and they'll 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 come in as, as uh, admission to to new states. Um, but the the problem is that, that that isn't happening actually. People aren't doing aren't doing that. They're not leaving. Um, they're not moving west uh, for all kinds of reasons. Partly, uh, in large part, because you know there's a vicious Native American resistance, and they don't want people settling in their land. Um, and so, and also because people uh, get to these places, and it turns out um, they want things like uh, they want things like property rights, right? They want things like title that can be enforced by the judge. Um, they want things like roads. Um, they want things like an army that can protect them. Uh, so, so what that means is that you actually need state power before settlers will come. Um, and so, what what Odom argues is that the real innovation of the Northwest Ordinance is. Um, is to imagine a territorial form of government, um, and uh, it's that there's a, there's going to be some period between before statehood uh, that where people will actually be uh, will not have political rights. At least in the federal government, right? So that's, that's very interesting to me. That really flipped the the, the, um, the way I've been thinking about this for a while. The relation into this territory is is um, you know if you read Butler's journal, always at Fort Pitt, he's like literally the, the U.S. Army cannot prevent them from going into this territory especially even in, into Ohio. Being from Marietta, we're very aware of this, you know, and uh, with, with um, the Northwest uh, Ordinance and the population coming in. I mean, that's, the, that's what happens to Kentucky is it's so disorganized. There's so many people moving in right. that they've lost total control. They're very oh. land uh, grants and land titles and things like this, and so to prevent that is largely the reason for the ordinance. Right? Yeah, when exactly. It's part of the ordinance. Right, right. there's, there's a the saying, you know, you buy land in Kentucky, you're buying a lawsuit, right? right. Nobody, the so titles are a mess. So they want specifically, but what that means is you need to have you need to have a state that's going to come in and pre-survey the land, and that's going to guarantee your title, and that's going to you know. So um, so you have this long. So the, the real innovation of the Northwest Ordinance is not the statehood, but the territorial part of it, organization. Right? Um, and and that's that's uh, to me that's very interesting because it creates this potential. It creates this um, period of time which which can last a long time. I mean, if you look at some places like Arizona or something, I mean, their territory is forever. Puerto Rico is still a territory, right? I mean, I could, I, I actually don't know, I, I, I need to ask a lawyer about this, but I think that I, you know, if I, if I as an American citizen who in Maryland has the right to vote, if I move to Puerto Rico, I lose my right, you know? So, um, so this is still the case, but, but people are okay with that if, uh, if there is some promise of future statehood, even if it's some time away, um, that's actually what entices them to the West. So, 
All this to say, this is a very long way of saying, I agree that the, that the federal government needs to get people on the land, and I agree that's probably one reason that they make the promise of equal power, but the fact that they can get these people on the land under territorial circumstances that are potentially uh, you know, decades long pushes back against that, right? There is some ability to get people, if you give them roads, if you give them markets, if you give them survey titles, uh, they, they seem to go even though they don't get uh, equal rights. Um, so, you know, anyway, that's just a uh, What about the, the duration? I mean, the, 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 I mean, the duration between territorial status and state status for these trans Appalachian states, and even the Mississippi Valley states, it's not super long. It's not Arizona or, or, or Hawaii or Puerto Rico. I mean, it's not, it's basically years, not decades. Yeah. No, I mean, I think that's, that's a fair point. point. The promise is real. It's going to move in the life That's a fair point. The promise is real, and it, and it, will, it will happen, and, and in fact, it does happen. It's only in those places. So this was um, so this was determined by Congress. I mean, the, the state had to agree to it, but it was determined by Congress. Um, and you know, one of the one of the interesting things also about okay, so this enabling legislation. I mean, Congress always passes an enabling act to bring in a new state. Um, and one of the things that's interesting about this enabling legislation is, is it suggests. I mean, this is what the Supreme Court is wrestling with. If I understand the, the um, if I understand it correctly. Uh, is that you know the question is what kind of conditions can the Congress impose on a new state when it's coming in? So, in theory, uh, Congress, I mean, in theory and in practice, Congress says this will come in as a free state. The thing is, if you're a state with equal on equal footing, you can do whatever you want. So the state legislature should be able to undo that uh, the next day if it chooses. But I mean, this remains a kind of ambiguous thing. It doesn't, to my knowledge, that never happens. Once the state comes in as either state or free, it stays that way. I mean, as I said, there were attempts. There were attempts, uh, of long lasting attempts for decades actually, to turn you know, Illinois and, and Indiana um, into slave states, but they, they, they never got very far, even though people persisted in it. Um, but uh, but you know, in theory, it should have been entirely possible for a state to you know, do that, because they, after all, they have equal footing. So you know, what, can con what conditions can Congress put on these states that could remain permanent if they have equal footing? Um, you know, this is, I think this is also, I think, one of who, said, who says this, who, he points out that although we say that these states have equal footing um, constitutionally, in practice, that's not at all the, the, the case, right? You, you can look to the enabling legislation at the first point. Um, you might say, well, it doesn't actually have validity after this becomes a state, but nonetheless, that's, none of the original states had enabling legislation. But the real one, the real difference, where the, state, where the new states are completely unequal to the old states is in land sales. The old states, when they sell land, the revenue goes to the state treasury. When the new states sell land, even after their states, it goes to the federal treasury. Um, and the federal government never gives up that, that power. It, uh, it would almost defeat the purpose of expansion. Uh, it never gives up the power to, to gain revenue from the sale of, of, of lands. So these are federal lands long after their states. Um, I mean, in the, in the western United States, a lot of land is still part of the federal government. It still causes these mini uprisings from time to time. Um, and, and, uh, and, and so, this is one way in which the old states and the new states, uh, in which this notion of equal footing is a, is a farce. I mean, they're, they're completely unequal. Um, and so, uh, you know, so anyway, equal footing is an interesting thing. <laughs> yeah, you know, interestingly, um, you know, the, this, is, this is almost, I mean, this is like kind of a, a, a detour, but, but it's not. Um, the, the Supreme Court decision that struck down the Voting Rights Act, or the central elements of the Voting Rights Act, uh, did so in the name of equal footing. Um, I, I only, you know, realized this uh, late, you know, after I've been engaged in this whole question. But it's really a, it, this question of equal footing and what it means is a, it is not just a kind of um, academic one. I mean, it has real political consequences. You know, the, the central elements of the, of the Voting Rights Act uh, were, were struck down by the current Supreme Court based on this principle. So, you know, uh, thinking harder about it seems to me an important uh, issue. Well, you're right. Remarks about the federal land sales um, are a good segue. Uh, the, only, the other person I know is working on the Northwest Ordinance is Michael Wicked. So it's at the core of, the, of an argument he's making about the, the debt is that ordinance is what's driving Indian policy. Whatever, whatever else the federal government does after that is really, it, it will be overwhelmed by the ordinance and this power to 
the power for statehood for all these territories, that they're the drivers for a lot of removal. So I was thinking of that interesting question you asked about other 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 rationales for creation of states. So I think in addition to removal, you can even look at um, railroad and look at the, the you know what's going on with those nine states that got admitted in the eighteen eighties. You know, the railroad instructions are in the mix there. So that there's there are these you know, federal economic interests, there's the sort of driving uh, force for removal that's still part of that um, that late nineteenth century and early twentieth century, even the Hawaii story. Yeah. Stories too. So I think that that could be another. You start with that threat. Right. That could be that could be another threat. Right. Well. No, that's right. I mean, you know, the, the issue of land sales is always it's a, tr it's a tricky one because it's never clear to me how much. I mean, uh, you know, there are lots of ideas. I mean, Jefferson would like to give away the land, um, but but it never gets very far because Congress says we need the money. We can't do it. I mean, this is how we're going to pay back our Revolutionary War debt. I mean, if the, if the federal finances are going to survive, it's because it's because of all this land um, and and the potential for for selling it. Uh, in the initial years, it provides almost new, no revenue at all. Um, and that's mostly, as I, as I was saying earlier, I mean, nobody, nobody wants to move into this territory because it's too risky. Um, so they can't sell any land there. Uh, Kentucky, you know, Kentucky was Virginia, so the land that uh, was to them anyway. Um, and so, uh, so, so the, the promise of, of eventual land sales always uh, lures Congress. And it's not until after the Civil War that they, or during the Civil War, that they passed the Homestead Act, right? Um, because they think, you know, up until then, and it always been, well, we need this land to sell money. Now, how much money does the federal government actually make on these land sales? Uh, I don't have an answer to that yet. You know, uh, yeah. I think it puts. I mean, it puts the treasury in surplus. It's part of what. It's part of the crisis, the economic crisis. It causes them on the pants. I think in some ways, that so much money is coming, flowing west to east, that it's part of um, the panic of 1837. I think mm -hmm. so. So significant. You know, probably even raw the numbers, not so great, but significant enough that it's. It's yeah, creating it's shift in the economy. Uh, yeah. It's disturbing the economy. But yet, I, I wasn't even thinking it's just about land sales. That's a federal interest. But I think if you're creating these these state these territorial state institutions of, re of removal, you know, it's a sub it's a subcontracting of removal to a certain extent. That's right. Uh, to these other units, so it's just it's part. Of, I mean, it doesn't that's, have that's right. To it. But but I mean, the federal government continues to insist on its sole authority to negotiate treaties, right? I mean. Um, but, but it, I mean, that's an interesting way to think about it, you know, it's subcontracting. It's reality, it's reality on the ground. It's, it's the, it's the, you know, it's flipping the population. And, yeah. Uh, so, and making, making conditions intolerable to it, so. Right, right. Yeah. Here we have time for a final question. Oh, well, that was the final question. <laughs> <laughs> I think that was, I think I've been talking my audience. <laughs>